Welcome to your Chapter 9, Part 1 video. This is Soil, the Foundation for Agriculture. All right, so uh, very first question that you have is what is the difference between cropland and rangeland? Um, as a side note, this chapter is going to be particularly important for those of you who have never actually been out of an urban or suburban area if you've never seen uh, rural areas and how farming actually works. Croplands are where you grow crops and crops are plants that you use for food or for fiber or and when I say food I don't just mean food for humans I mean food for feeding animals that humans then eat as well. Rangeland is pasture that's used for grazing livestock. A rangeland is not necessary to grow livestock and livestock are animals that humans eat, that includes pigs and chicken and goats and cattle. The, those are the, the main ones. We're going to discuss a little bit later uh, how those animals are raised more typically here in the United States. But in areas where they are allowed to roam free as they are in this lower picture, that's what rangeland is. So please know the difference between crops and livestock especially. All right, second question. What are the consequences of farming on unsuitable lands? Um, you have considerable environmental damage. If you did start with a marginal grassland that becomes desert, you cut down a forest to go ahead and build. Soil, uh, forests are destroyed. All of those things diminish biodiversity. Whenever it is that you change a landscape, you diminish biodiversity. You encourage invasive species to come in because the invasive species are generalists. and they are more likely to take over in a time of change. You pollute the soil, air, and water with toxic chemicals. Those toxic chemicals come from everything from synthetic fertilizer to the uh, waste materials produced by uh, heavy machinery that are used for farming purposes. And that's things like tractors as an example. And then fertile soil is blown or washed away when it is left without any plants in it. So when you're dealing with land that's not 100% suitable for growing crops on in the first place, you basically are going to create deserts, get rid of the animals that live there because you're ruining their habitat so biodiversity goes down, and create an area where crops can then no longer be grown. All right. You also may want to grab your book real quick, and I'm going to be referring to a lot of figures and tables and pages in the book, so you may want to have it next to you. So go get it. I'll wait. Okay, you're back. This has to do with figure 9.1. Which countries or continents suffer from very degraded soil? When you look at this map that I have here, that would be the areas of serious concern. And you can see it's pretty much almost everywhere. But if you have to pick something on a test, you want to pick things that... Pick places where there are lots of people who need to farm the soil in order to survive. So most of Western Europe China, parts of Africa along the Sahara Desert, uh, those areas are of great concern for, for soil degradation. To degrade soil means that you make its quality very poor. That basically is heading into making that area a desert. Figure 9.2, what are the main causes of soil degradation worldwide? Be able to recognize the three largest categories in order. They're overgrazing, deforestation, and cropland agriculture. I will not ask you to differentiate between those percentages because they're very close. So overgrazing to graze means a livestock animal eats grass down to the point that it can't grow back. Deforestation is where you cut down trees in a forest and um, basically get rid of it. And then cropland agriculture, that is when you use pure, poor agricultural practices to um, to farm with and then you leave behind very poor soil that can no longer support plant life in general. Remember when you don't have plants in the ground there's no roots to keep the soil there and the first time it rains or the wind blows the good soil washes away creating a desert. It's kind of a positive feedback loop. Um, okay, so what pivotal change took place about 10,000 years ago? What was like uh, life like bef uh, for man before this time? 
before 10,000 years ago, humans were nomadic hunter-gatherers. They were in small groups, uh, family groups related to each other, about between 20 and 50, much like this Aboriginal tribe here. Um, taking a look at them, I, this is probably an Australian Aboriginal tribe. Uh, you would travel from place to place, um, uh, anticipating when food resources would be plentiful in a certain area and, and uh, also follow sources of fresh water. Uh, the benefit of hunter-gatherers is because the groups are small and because you move around, you don't really leave a permanent mark on the environment. 10,000 years ago, we figured out how to grow plants and how to keep animals together so that we could go and get them when we wanted to eat them. So we stayed in one place and this is called the agricultural revolution. Um, let's see, how does, in order to get the, the plants and animals to have those characteristics that we want, we engaged in what's called selective breeding. This is the next question, how does it work? Um, uh, selective breeding is where you only allow plants and animals with desired traits to produce offspring. So you have the fattest cows or the biggest ears of corn. You save seeds from the corn and only grow those next year uh, from the best ears. Uh, your fattest cows and bulls, you make sure that only they mate so that you, you basically are enhancing evolution and you're forcing it to go in one direction towards the traits that you want to keep. Uh, why engage in selective breeding to encourage the desirable traits in food sources larger fruit, bigger udders on cows for more milk, etc., etc. Right, number seven, what area is accepted as the first region to start practicing agriculture? Be able to recognize its location on a map, figure 9.3 in your book. This is the Fertile Crescent. It was between the Tigris and Euphrates. It was an incredible and uh, very rich place to grow crops. Um, it is now located in um, uh, the area that is uh, Syria, Iraq, and Iran, which as we know now are deserts. As you're going to see when you read your cartoon guide, people did that. Those deserts are man-made. Let's see. What two major crops originated here? So if you take a look at this map, that's this area right in here. It's wheat and barley. We're going to talk a little bit later about how certain crops are uh, used as a major food source in most of the countries in the world. Uh, in that particular area, that's where wheat and barley came from. All right, compare and contrast subsistence agriculture and intensive agriculture. Subsistence agriculture is where farmers only produce what their immediate family needs, so a little plot outside with the family, it's what's called a kitchen garden, and you grow just enough for you and your family to eat, and that's it. A couple chickens, a couple cows, then you're done. Uh, intensive agriculture is where a family grows and um, uh, uh, nurtures crops and livestock uh, more than the family can eat. So it's intended for the extras to be sold at market or to be traded for other things the family does not have. So subsistence, just what you need. Intensive, it's a little bit extra so that your uh, family has a little bit extra to deal with when they go uh, to, to use basically as funds when they go to the market. All right, then there's something called industrialized agriculture. And as you can see from these two pictures, it is large scale agriculture and it is all intended to be sold. So what techniques does industrialized agriculture use to boost yield, predict the effects these methods have on the environment? Uh, you intensify irrigation, so you use tons of water. You use synthetic fertilizer. Um, remember that's made with the Haber-Bosch process. You use chemical pesticides to increase your yield. Um, the synthetic fertilizer also increases your yield because it encourages the plants to grow. You plant in what's called a monoculture. Listen to that word. Mono means one and culture is a kind of thing. So if you look there on the left, uh, you can see it's just wheat. And then there on the right, it's just cows. Basically both as far as the eye can see. What are some effects? Excess fertilizer use can lead to eutrophication. Uh, excess water use can lead to water shortages. Um, these types of uh, farming methods are not concerned with keeping plants in the ground at all times, so uh, fertilizer and soil can wash into water, polluting it. Reduction of biodiversity. Whenever you have a monoculture of any sort, nothing else can really live there. So biodiversity goes down in those particular area. Extinction of non-target species. Uh, you've got to kill everything else before you can grow or raise your livestock or crops there. 
Uh, desertification, again, overuse of land, basically makes it into a desert, yada, yada, yada. Um, as you can see here at the bottom where it says feedlots, um, that is how most uh, cows are raised. Most cattle is raised here in the United States. That's basically where you feed them grain in tightly packed pens of basically mud in their own waste. We're going to talk about that more in chapter 10. And um, let's see if the Green Revolution is being talked about yet. No, I know it says Green Revolution down there, but uh, on this slide, we're going to talk about it momentarily. All right, so we talked about what a monoculture is. Oh, here's fertilizer. Um, I'm going to put this into the um, supplemental section. You're going to need to know what the three elements are that go into phosphorus. NPK, that's nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Those are the three things that plants need to grow. And those numbers that are over them is the percent of fertilizer by mass that is those elements. So kind of cool, but you are going to need to know NPK. All right, so you've seen a monoculture. What's a polyculture? A polyculture is where you grow a bunch of different things at the same time. So um, predict the benefits and drawbacks. All right, so I'll talk about the monoculture again, which is this guy back here. Uh, monoculture, you just grow one thing. Now, here's the pro. I'm sure you can see it is easy to manage. It's easy to harvest. Um, only one kind of bug is going to come there and eat it, so you only have to use one kind of fertilizer. And when it comes time to harvest the stuff, you just... You just get it all up at the same time. You don't have to worry about things being at different heights. It's really easy to manage on a large scale. The cons, of course, are loss of biodiversity even within that plant. So that means that um, one disease could wipe the whole thing out because there's not a lot of genetic variation even within the wheat, let alone the fact that there's no other plants in there. So if the right kind of disease or bug comes through there, you're gonna lose all 800 acres of wheat, which is a lot. All right, so polycultures. Um, that's where you grow a bunch of different things at the same time. Here on the left, this is called the Three Sisters. This is what the Native Americans used to do. They used to plant corn, beans, and squash all at the same time, leave on their nomadic cycle through the land, and then when they came back, everything was ready to go. Squash covered the ground, providing a natural cover that kept um, evaporation low. Uh, the corn, uh, grew straight and the beans used it as a support and then meanwhile beans are a legume and their roots have nitrogen fixing bacteria so all of those plants there then also had um, uh, lots of nitrogen to um, nitrogen bearing compounds to use for their growth so pros are that you can pick and choose your plants so that they complement each other there are certain kinds of plants that are natural pesticides like marigolds as an example so uh, you kind of just throw it all together and forget it. The, the, the con is you really can only hand harvest this stuff. And um, because, uh, you know, again, they're all different types of plants. They're going to be ready at slightly different times. So it's more labor intensive for harvesting. And uh, oh, one more pro is if a disease for one kind of plant comes through, the rest of them are just fine because usually it's, it's a disease or an insect is very target specific. Let's see if I missed anything. All right, um, here again is the mutually beneficial um, uh, planting of the three sisters, squash, corn, and bacteria. Uh, this is something that would be good to remember for a free response question on how these three types of plants help each other. All right, uh, the Green Revolution, which I had, was on a previous slide. I explain what the Green Revolution is and its effect on industrialized agriculture. The Green Revolution is the use of technology um, uh, specific crop varieties are usually genetically modified that are, are made to do especially well in different conditions and then farming techniques on a large scale we're talking the use of fossil fuel driven machinery um, and lots of water use and lots of synthetic um, pesticides and um, fertilizer use you're basically just throwing water fertilizer pesticides at these plants to keep them growing and you're really not concerned about um, those effects on the environment in general. The good news is that that produces a, a large yield per acre. So um, the Green Revolution meant that these techniques could be taken to developing countries to increase their food yield. 
Um, please realize the Green Revolution has nothing to do with organic farming. In fact, in a lot of ways, it is anti, it is the opposite of organic farming. All right, soil is more than ground up minerals. What other types of things can be found in soil? You can find organic matter, that means like dead and decaying stuff, air, water, pockets of space to hold the water, living microorganisms like bacteria, algae, and protists and fungi, larger organisms like earth we, uh, earthworms, insects, mites, millipedes, centipedes, burrowing mammals, amphibians, and reptiles. How is soil formed? Describe the process from bedrock to um, soil, giving specific examples of physical, chemical, and biological weathering. Um, physical weathering, by the way, just means stuff is moving around. Chemical means an actual chemical is involved. And biological means an, a, a plant or animal did something about it. So here's how it goes. Uh, and here you take a look at this picture you can see in the back it goes from bedrock to the front uh, soil that plants can use for their growth so bedrock becomes soil um, through weathering um, erosion decomposition deposition of organic matter um, okay physical weathering is like wind rain uh, thermal pressure, so water gets into the rock, it freezes, so it cracks it apart, and then it melts again. Um, other abiotic means anything where you're physically moving around the bedrock to grind it down. Chemical weathering would be if you, uh, any sort of chemical changes in the soil, nitrate levels, phosphate levels, the pH levels change, and all of those can help to break down the rock. Biological weathering is a uh, breakdown by living things like lichen, um, like plant root roots, like earthworms, as an example. All right. Um, so here again is uh, bedrock to soil, and you can see that it has different layers, or what are called horizons. We're going to talk about those momentarily. Um, so how, well, uh, let's see. Table nine point one. What five factors influence soil formation? That would be the climate that you've got, the organisms that you have. Topographical, topographical relief means um, if you've got a really flat area, you're not going to see a lot of um, movement. There's not going to be a lot of erosion due to gravity, and there's not going to be a lot of deposition. That means that something is slid and moved somewhere else. When you've got a mountain, you're going to have a lot of that going on that's going to help to grind the bedrock down. Um, parent material. The parent material is what the bedrock is made of. Some uh, bedrock grinds up more quickly and easily easily than others. Um, it also influences the kind of soil that eventually forms. That should make sense. The, the makeup of the parent determines the makeup of the soil, and then just time. How much time do you have? Um, the more time you have, the more um, different characteristics you'll, you will see in the soil, the mature soil. It has time to, gr to grind down, have um, dead and decaying plant matter in it, to have air pockets and all of that other good stuff. If you're looking at this, these are all, um, we're going to come back to these. these. This is all soil from different places, and we're going to talk about why um, it's kind of important that you see all of these different types of layers. All right, um, this is an important slide, and it's also an important figure in your book, figure 9.7. Um, describe the components of a soil profile. A, so a soil profile is what the soil looks like from the very top and then as you dig down to the bedrock. No matter where you go, and no matter how thick or thin the different layers are, all soil has the following layers. They're also called horizons. Um, it goes O, A, E, B, C, R. O horizon is the top layer, or uh, the leaf litter layer. It's stuff that just drops on top of the soil. So the O horizon isn't the soil yet. Um, it's also called humus. For the love of God, do not call it Hummus. Hummus is a dip made out of chickpeas. Humus is a layer of leaves and dead and decaying, dead and decaying material that's on top of the actual soil. Um, the A horizon is topsoil. You can buy this at Home Depot. It is the layer with the most nutrition in it. It is organic material mixed with minerals. The E horizon, I know this says um, alluviation layer. That's where the E comes from. It's a transition layer through which um, nutrients can leach down. I'm going to take a second to tell you. Um, uh, no, you know what? I'll wait to the next question. That word leach, I'm going to define it in a second. The B layer is the subsoil that is forming new soil. Um, it's also a sink of lost nutrients. So that means that 
anything in that if there's excess water uh, the nutrition from the topsoil can end up going through the E horizon and getting locked in the B horizon meaning although there is nutrition here the plants can't get to it and then the C layer is weathered parent material that's only slightly altered and then the R horizon is the bedrock um, so actually going back here to these uh, let's see you can see this this the horizons here but here you can see the different horizons and uh, if you were a soil biologist you would be able to tell exactly where in the world these things came from because again remember the parent material and the kind of plants and animals that are around determine what's in the soil and we're going to talk about you're like oh well that's clay yeah we're going to talk about that in a second but you can clearly see the different horizons anywhere you go where you dig down you can clearly see the different layers in the soil all right um, here is another uh, graphic that you can look at describe how water makes its way through a soil horizon explain why water moving through soil can be a problem for plants that's that word leaching to leach means um, that water dissolves um, stuff in a top layer and then through the action of gravity takes whatever that is and the water pulls that dissolved stuff with it into lower layers of the soil so leaching water is moving downward through the action of gravity dissolving and carrying in this case nutrients with it um, when we talk about landfills uh, water dissolves and takes away with it something completely different okay the minerals that are most leached are iron aluminum and silicate clay not going to test you on those but they may be something that you want to keep in the back of your head it can end up depriving plants of necessary nutrients all right um, what four characteristics are used to describe the character of soil um, explain what each characteristic tells us about soil um, you've got color texture structure and pH the color of the soil can tell you what kind of particles are in there and also how much um, humus is in there so how much nutrition is in there uh, if you dig down into the soil here in Florida you're going to notice it's usually like a light tan or a light gray that tells you it's made of sand and there's not a whole lot of nutrition in there the texture when you feel it the the feel can tell you what kind of particles are in there and um, this is we're going to be doing a lab on this okay the structure of the soil if you look at it under a microscope again you can tell the different types of particles from each other there's three I'm gonna to get to it in a second and then the pH uh, different types of plants like to grow in different uh, types of soil some like acidic soil some like basic soil so the pH of the soil determines what kinds of plants you have that determines primary productivity which then determines the biodiversity of an area kind of it all builds on each other um, that there the ability to support uh, uh, Cation exchange and the amount of leaching. We've already talked about the amount of leaching. Um, ability to support cation exchange is coming in a minute. All right, there are three types of soil particles, and besides the soil horizons, I can virtually guarantee there's going to be a question on this on the national exam. Three types of soil particles are, in order of size from big to small, sand, silt, and clay. If sand were the size of a basketball, silt would be the size of a baseball, and clay would be the size of a golf ball. Um, this is not in your book. We're going to talk about it as part of the supplemental stuff, but think about how sand is when you're at the beach. Water flows through it very readily, so it drains really well. It retains very badly. Clay um, has poor drainage and good water retention. So when you think about plants, some plants like to have a lot of water near their roots and other plants like their roots to be practically dry. So again, the character of the soil, the type of soil particles you have can determine what kinds of plants you have. The word loam is a mixture of two or more of these types of soils. Um, and it is a mixture of those types of soils that is uh, generally best for plant growth. This is called a soil texture triangle. You're going to learn how to use this here very soon. Um, there are different names that instantly will tell you how much sand, silt, or clay is in a particular sample of soil, and then you can make some good guesses as to what kind of plants grow out of it. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, we're going to do that example a little bit later too. You're going to learn how to use this triangle. All right, cation exchange. Um, you're only going to have to know this in brief. Uh, cations or cations are positively charged ions. 
You do need to know that. Things like calcium, magnesium, potassium. Plants get them by exchanging hydrogen ions for these. It's like a, um, it's like a business exchange. So um, they use acidity in the soil to go, hey soil, here's a hydrogen atom. All right, now give me a potassium atom. If you look at this picture, those K pluses, that's potassium. So if you take a look at this, this is a really good brief description of cation exchange. Um, so uh, plant roots give the soil a hydrogen ion and in exchange takes up um, calcium, magnesium, or potassium. Um, nutrient ions are then replenished through exchange with soil water. Different soils have different capacities to hold cations. Fine texture um, and soils rich in organic matters have the greatest capacity to do this. The lower the pH, the diminished the capacity. Lower pH also is associated with a higher exchange of harmful aluminum ions. Um, so aluminum, bad for plants. All right. Um, how and why does soil change from place to place? We've already talked about this. Differences in temperature and rainfall largely influence soil types. And then through the five factors, that influence soil formation, which are back, or one more, right here. Um, no, sorry. These guys, climate, organisms, topography, parent material, and time. Are you gonna have to identify those in a multiple choice? Probably not. You probably wanna commit a couple of those to memory for an FRQ. What is Swidden agriculture? Why is it a poor choice for feeding a high density population? This is from figure 9.9. .9. What is another name for Swidden agriculture? Okay, Swidden agriculture is the clearing of tropical forests, specifically tropical forests for farming. You use it for a few years and then you um, clear, you, you, you cut down the trees and you burn the trees down so that you can use another patch when the first patch is no longer viable. The word viable means it's no longer got nutrients in it. You can't grow anything in it anymore. So basically, here's what happens. You go into the forest, you cut a bit down, you burn the uh, trees. So you fold it back into the soil so the soil has some nutrients in it. You grow stuff, and then you find out after a couple of years, stuff stops growing there. So you cut some more forest down, and so on and so forth. The problem is, of course, if you have farmed a land until it no longer has any nutrients in it, it means that the forest cannot grow back there either. So you're basically creating little patches of desert wherever you go. This is a poor choice because um, you're eventually going to run out of places to grow. It's a very inefficient way of feeding a high density population. And if you remember anything about the tropical rainforest, their soil is crap in the first place. So you, you know going into this, you're only going to be able to get two or three years of crops out of your land. Now the question is, of course, why do people do this? The answer is they don't really have another choice or they don't know of any other way of doing this because things like fertilizer and industrial um, industrialized agricultural machinery is expensive. Um, another name for this is slash and burn agriculture. All right, what type of biome is a poor choice for farming? That would be the tropical rainforest because their soil is acidic and terrible. The reason the soil is terrible is two reasons. Number one, things grow so quickly there, any nutrients that end up in the soil quickly get taken up by plants. So all of the nutrients are in the plants. And then secondly, with the constant rain, you've got all of this leaching down into the subsoil. Any nutrients that are left completely go out of the soil. Um, what? Okay, so here's some more pictures of Swidden architect, uh, agriculture. Excuse me. All right. Um, what is a good choice for farming? That would be the prairie. Um, uh, very, very rich soil. When you get rid of the grass, uh, the soil is fantastic. Um, that is where we grow stuff here in the United States. But at least for a while, if you don't use good farming practices, you can still turn this into a desert after about 10 or 20 years, which we're actually going to see um, happened during the, the Dust Bowl. We're going to be talking about that a little bit later. Um, but that is the end of this particular video.